So on to our work in engaging with diverse and underrepresented communities. That's quite a long sentence and I'm stumbling over that. But I'm really delighted to introduce my lovely colleague, Sadia, who is, as I said, the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Lead for our services. So welcome, Sadia. Really lovely to see you this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, Catherine. Uh, it's lovely to have you here. So I think it would be a really good idea for us to start off and talk about really why is it so important that we engage with underrepresented communities? I mean, there are many out there, aren't there? And so it's really difficult for us to focus on everybody. And I know we'll touch on that a little bit later on. But why do we need to do this? And why is your work important? Um. Well, it's really important that we, we do understand um, the information and support needs of uh, different communities. Um, you know, breast cancer can affect anyone. Um, yeah. And we are here for anybody who's been affected by breast cancer. So that means, you know, we do need to look at how we engage with different communities. Everybody has different needs, different information and support needs. So yeah. one size we know doesn't fit all. Um, so that's why it's really important that we do get to hear about what those information and support needs are so that we're better informed. We can clearly understand what the what that particular need is and have a look at how we could provide it as well. So it's to improve accessibility, it's to enhance uh, inclusiveness, um, and it's to really reach out to those communities who might not really know about us as well. So we want to ensure that we find particular ways that work for those communities in terms of reaching them and also just listening to those diverse experiences around breast cancer so that we can understand some of those maybe complex and unique issues as well yeah. that they particularly um, uh, face. I guess, I guess we all think that we're sort of being inclusive and from a, our perspective we think include everybody and that's that's what is necessary but actually when you find out more you find out what's important and what works for different communities, um, different ethnic backgrounds or cultures and it's really important to dig deeper to find out their needs rather than just make it if we include everybody that that works is that right it, it, yeah and and you know when we look at particularly health inequalities you know the health inequalities can affect any community but there are particular communities where health inequalities and health inequities exacerbate the cancer outcomes within those particular communities so it's important for us to really understand one what is going on there um you know, what do those outcomes actually look like as well? And how how can we navigate through that to try and support and help those communities um, better? Um, so, and, and, and I'm just going back to um, you mentioning MCAM, which is Ethnic Minority Cancer Awareness Month. Obviously, this takes place in, in July, so I'll just touch upon that. It used to be Ethnic Minority Cancer Awareness Week but it's been changed to month and, and it was developed, a campaign developed by Cancer uh, Equality um, a number of years ago actually. It's really a time for organisations and people in the community to kind of come together um, and collectively and collaboratively raise awareness about cancer within ethnic communities and also to highlight some of the challenges or the issues or even things like signs and symptoms, for example, awareness raising happens within July. However, you know, we at Breast Cancer now, we are dedicated to our work in engaging with diverse communities. So we, we don't just limit ourselves to July. We, you know, engage with them way before that and beyond July because we want to embed that throughout our work streams when it looks at how we engage with uh, diverse communities out there. Yeah, definitely. So the work isn't done. There's a lot more that we can do, much, much more work that we can do to make things better and, and get things right. There is, there is. There's a lot, lot more to do. Um, and especially if we want to be able to support everybody, everyone who's been affected by breast cancer, then we need to really take into account, you know, those that are marginalised communities or underrepresented communities. Um, and that kind of brings me on to what particular kind of communities are we looking at? What groups are we talking about? Okay. Here? Um, so we are looking at, for example, uh, uh, older women, uh, women over the age of uh, 70 particularly. We are looking at black women, um, South Asian women as well, 
but also another group which is, you know, quite uh, uh, a number of groups actually fall within that is those who live in a socioeconomically disadvantaged area. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll talk about those four particular groups uh, okay. around, you know, why are we looking at those four particular groups? Um, and pres presumably there are barriers in each of those groups that you're going to let us know about. I mean, that's not they'll be not exhaustive and obviously there'll be differences, won't they? But if you can pick up those barriers, then that arms us with that information to be able to sort of approach things in a, an appropriate way and break down, down those barriers and hopefully bring people to us and, as you say, improve health outcomes as well. Certainly, and 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 if we look, if we look at particularly, because um, you've mentioned barriers, when we look at, um, you know, what do these communities uh, experience? Some of those barriers are quite universal; they flow across all those communities, mm. and some are quite unique as well. So, you know, people may, for example, when we say barriers, what do we mean? Barriers, for example, in accessing services to yeah. gaining that support or seeking that help and support. People can be unaware maybe about what services we offer or what services are offered by other organisations. That can be quite a big barrier. If they don't know about us, they're not going to come to us. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if they don't know about us and they're not going to come to us, we, we're kind of limited in the opportunity to hear about their experiences, which is why we need to work harder from our end as well into reaching mm -hmm. those communities. There may be physical barriers for people when it comes to accessing um, services. It could be down to... Uh, you know, d disability, for example, it could be down to the geographical area where a service, particular service is being delivered. People may have transport issues as well. And I'll go on later to talk about how we can ease that financial yeah. burden of transport when accessing a service. There's lots of social and cultural barriers as well, which prevent people from accessing services or finding out about services. There's a number of um attitudinal but also emotional barriers too some people may have had a very poor experience at using a particular service maybe yeah. elsewhere and feel a bit more reluctant to access maybe another service elsewhere loss of trust within organizations within the health system there's a multiple layer of barriers that come together and play a part it's never usually one single barrier yeah. there's also when we look at information barriers as well, and you know, that's when, when organizations look at maybe their responsibility at the types of information they're providing, what formats is it coming in? Is it suitable for a particular person, an individual or a group? So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot to do in terms of um, looking at the suitability and the diverse range of information materials as well. And we work, we worked very hard, I think, at Breast Cancer now towards that. And we do offer a number of health information formats in different formats for people. We have some, uh, for example, booklets in different languages as well. We have some easy reads. So, but our work isn't still done there. We're no. learning all the time, aren't we? Definitely more on the list to be able to get to and do to be able to expand the breadth of that offer um, yeah. of different languages as well. And the things that you've been talking about are barriers. Um, you know, you talked about unique barriers and universal barriers. And we definitely come across, um, you know, when we talk on the helpline to people that we can't see. And actually, unless we ask their ethnic background or a bit more about their circumstances or that type of thing, we haven't got any idea. So, you know, what's been going on? On for them isn't evident unless we chat through those sorts of things and then it becomes apparent but giving the people the opportunity and saying we're here for you to talk to us if you'd like to do that and, and trust us in the confidential service that we provide on the helpline is really important getting that out um, as one sort of gateway to our services and everything that we can offer um, now and hopefully improved in the future as well. And a really key point you've made there Catherine particularly around you know, when we have those discussions, when you have them on the helpline with people, it's getting to know the people, getting to know their circumstances. And sometimes, you know, if we ask for information, it's so that we can get a bit better picture of your support needs and, and, and so that we can actually look at where we ought to tailor a particular service to your needs as well. So there's a reason as to why we may ask for that data or for that information is so that we can look at, you know, best 
matched support shall we say that can connect we, we we could look at providing yeah them. yeah just that tailoring and that personalization because what one person wants isn't what another person wants or fits with you know their situation or their culture or whatever it is you know yeah yeah and that and that kind of brings in the the uh, equity part because when when we look at if we want to look at equality yeah we could maybe have a resource and provide that to everybody so we're providing it quite equally but when we look at equity is that resource actually serving a purpose for everyone it won't because we know one size won't won't fit all and uh, won't fit all um, and we know that a particular mm -hmm. resource given to someone or support might not be suitable for the other person so when we look at equity we've got to really look at what we're we providing for that unique individual and how suitable is it for them to be able to get gain benefit from using that particular service or intervention? Um, I know we touched upon like having our uh, booklets in different languages. So we know that language barrier can be quite a big barrier for certain communities um, where English is not their first language. So, you know, as uh, from a services perspective, we're always looking at ways to improve that and see how we can get people to to come and access our services as well. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that a bit later on when we look at um, uh, how we're bringing um, certain interventions in. So, like for example, the access fund, we're having that translated into different languages as well, so people can understand. We've got something like the access fund available. We also have obviously language line, which people yeah. use on the helpline, which you 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 know about, Catherine. Yeah, but but it's not used an awful lot, and so I think that demonstrates, you know, that sort of accessibility, or maybe even just knowing that, or knowing that the helpline is there, but not knowing that the language line can be used alongside it. It does say it in an awful lot of our information, but if that information isn't in your language, you know, a way that you can understand, then that's obviously going to be a barrier too. But language line can be used, and we use it very successfully on the helpline. So if anybody sort of wants to know more about um, that, then. And, uh, you know, obviously they can, we can ask about that and pop some information on as well. Um, but yeah, that can use that very successfully to help people. And and just going back onto the, the, the barrier side of things. So we've, we've looked at also people not knowing about a service, but also people maybe, even if they do, they might find it difficult to make a decision as to choosing the right kind of support or service as well. And I guess when we look at the the other side of things, it's the systemic barriers that might also be existing. And and for example, if there's non inclusive service design, um, which can give rise to gaps in the service provision as well. Like we said, you know, it, it's, it, one particular service is not going to meet the needs of everybody. Um, but also looking at where we deliver our services, is it going to be locally, centrally, or regionally? And each of those three areas come with their own challenges for those specific individuals taking into account you know accessibility as well we want to listen to what people have to say so those who are um, listening to us today share your views on how we can improve that accessibility to our services so you know it's, it's about making some of those changes taking into account the neurodiverse for example making yeah. things work for people so that they can access our services but we'd like to hear about that we'd like to listen to your to your particular needs um if i go back to those particular four groups that i yeah, i was going to ask sort of what is it about those groups that has made us want to concentrate in the first instance at least because yeah. we've got to start somewhere with some groups we can't do everything all at once then what is it that has made um, you know us focus on those yeah um so uh, there's a number of re reasons one of them includes the fact that we already have some evidence um, in terms of those four groups in relation to, say, um, the outcomes um, of having a diagnosis of breast cancer. So um, I'll just cite some of those facts and okay. some of those figures as well so that we can really get a good understanding as to why it's important to focus on. Okay, on that'd be great. So if we look at um, people over the age of 70, um, usually data is broken down for people over the age of 70 or 75. But if, you know, if we look at just how many older women uh, get breast cancer in the UK, you're looking at of an average of like 19,000 women aged 70 and above. That's a big diagnosis. group. That's a very big group. That's uh, around 35% of the cases. Okay. And, uh, or another way to look at it is, is one in three of all okay. cases. Um and, you know, if we look at 
particularly the mortality rate, then in the UK, we're looking at around uh, 6,000, uh, just over 6,700 women die from breast cancer age 70 or over. Wow. Um, and also then if we look at the late diagnosis in older women with breast cancer, um, women diagnosed with breast cancer over the age of 70 are more likely to be diagnosed at a later stage compared to um, a younger age group. Late presentation of symptoms as well is linked with poorer survival outcomes, yeah. as you know. Um, so older women have been found to uh, wait longer than younger women before presenting with symptoms of breast cancer. Um, and also older women are more likely to be newly diagnosed with secondary breast cancer compared to white younger women. So we right. know there's a number of um, uh, uh, issues there that we need to really look at and address and find out how can we reach older women as well and, and give them the support and information that they need when they you know, are diagnosed with, okay. with breast cancer. And just on that note with you saying about older women being that little bit more likely to be uh, diagnosed with secondary breast cancer, so, you know, later stage, stage four, metastatic breast cancer, then obviously we do have services for those with a diagnosis of secondary breast cancer. And I do know that we've got an online session for um, talking about secondary breast cancer and management of that and support of, of that patient group, um, that, that the, you know, the 70 plus, which is coming up this next month. So um, we didn't chat about that before, but it's just sort of popped into my head. So, you know, just to plug that one out there for if anybody's living with secondary breast cancer, they've got a diagnosis and they are uh, 70 plus and they wanted to join that, um, then we would be able to direct you and pop a, pop a link in for, for that and how you'd find more information out about that. So I thought I'd say that whilst I remembered, Sadia. Thank you, Catherine. That's really, really useful, um, useful to know. Um, if we move on to the um, uh, black and South Asian women, so looking at ethnicity, mm. um, you know, how are ethnically diverse communities, how are they impacted by breast cancer? Um, in the UK, breast cancer incidence rates are lower in women from ethnically diverse backgrounds, including South Asian, black, Chinese and mixed groups when okay. compared to white women. However, um, women from these backgrounds experience differences uh, in breast screening attendance, the stage and age of diagnosis, survival outcomes, and also experiences around care and, and treatment as well. Okay. There's also evidence that black women, for example, are disproportionately affected by triple negative breast cancer. Mm, very common in black women and yeah. yeah. And also, um, if, if you know anyone is from the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry as well, or have a rare cancer or a genetic condition in the family, then this can also increase increase the risk. So we already know that there's some information there, or the evidence there that's showing that, that there's work that needs to be done with these communities. Mm -hmm. it, even when you look at breast screening as well, evidence is there to show that from women from ethnic backgrounds, um, there's a lower uptake um, due to maybe cultural or language barriers or just a lack of tailored interventions. Yeah. Um, alongside that, if we look at the age of diagnosis, there's a lack of recent data. So this is the thing data also plays a key part in our knowledge and how we understand how breast cancer affects different communities. But there is a lack of recent data on the age of diagnosis by ethnicity. However, the evidence that does exist suggests that women from ethnically diverse backgrounds in the UK are diagnosed at a younger age compared to white women. Okay. And even if you look at the stage of diagnosis, black women are more likely to be diagnosed with more advanced breast cancers and breast cancers that have fewer treatment options, such as triple, triple negative, negative, which we mentioned. Yeah. So, so, so we know that that particular um, uh, information, knowledge, or evidence is is there for us to work upon. And we we all we know that late stage diagnosis is is associated with poorer survival outcomes mm. in women from ethnically yeah. diverse backgrounds. Even looking at awareness um, kind of levels, you know, studies suggest women with breast cancer from ethnically diverse communities have lower breast cancer awareness and knowledge of symptoms and okay. risk factors compared to white women. And if we move over to looking at patient experience, particularly, you know, there is some evidence that suggests women from, uh, uh, say, 
Asia, South Asian backgrounds, they report higher levels of depression, anxiety and poor quality of life when measured compared to white women as well. So there are a number of um, areas uh, that we do we do need to look at. But all this is saying to us that this is, these are the groups that also need to be reached out to mm. and given that support. And if, if we carry on and look at particularly... Um, areas of deprivation as mm -hmm. well and there are some quite startling findings around around that when it comes to looking at breast cancer uh, and its impact so breast cancer incidence rates are lower in the most deprived areas in England Scotland and Wales compared to the least deprived area so the incidence is lower um, if Northern Ireland is slightly different, there's a different pattern seen there where there's similar incidence rates, whether it's okay. most or least deprived. Um, I don't know too much about that, but in England, Scotland and Wales, we know there's a lower incidence in the most deprived areas. Mm. If we look at the stage of the diagnosis, women living in the most deprived areas are more likely to be diagnosed at a later stage of breast cancer than those living in the least deprived areas. So yeah. there's information there around the staging. When we look at screening, women living in the most deprived areas are less likely to attend breast screening compared to those from the least deprived areas. So I know we mentioned about breast screening in ethnic groups having a low uptake, but yeah. this is the pattern we're seeing in areas of deprivation as well. In terms of survival, women living in the most deprived areas have lower breast cancer survival rates than women living in the least deprived areas. And that's although, even though the incidence rate is lower, but still yeah. they're more susceptible. Yeah, because of their later stage presentation, we know that, uh, so it is that awareness and that information that, and that education to people to come forward sooner and attend screening and encourage them and work with them to be able to do that and access that and access services to report symptoms, which will improve overall outcomes if we can manage to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, there, there's so there's lots of areas to to work on um, across the board but uh, just touching back upon the patient experience as well of, of people from um, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged areas people living with breast cancer in the most deprived areas in England rate their overall health and quality of life lower than those from the least deprived areas and that's taken from the cancer quality of life survey 2022 from NHS digital and if you look at people in Wales, people living with breast cancer in the most deprived areas in Wales rate their overall care lower than those from the least deprived areas. And that's taken from the Wales Cancer Patient Survey 2021 data. So that was, that was, I know that's a lot to take in and that's a lot of information, but that gives you the, the, uh, an idea of the evidence that's currently existing. And also when we look at our services, uh, user uptake although we do have people coming from these particular communities we want to really improve on that a lot more yeah so there's an awful lot of reasons there and evidence for okay. us to sort of carry on and and continue to try and work with communities to work out what's best for them and how we can sort of help and support them whether that's as a breast awareness um you know before breast cancer is uh, diagnosed or whether it is the support and the treatment of those people so loads of reasons and reasons that i guess you know me as a nurse I've heard over so many years when I've been involved in, in breast cancer and we haven't necessarily as a country, not necessarily just as a charity, really, when we're talking about services here, but overall health, thinking about the fact that we haven't made massive inroads. There may well be pockets and projects that have made inroads into that. And, you know, whether that's screening and encouraging, you know, sort of particular groups to come forward for screening. And of course, COVID came along and actually made probably made a difference to what any positive difference that might have been made that may well have you know had a negative effect on as it has done on so many aspects of all of our lives so yeah this is sort of really getting back to basics and having a look so do you want to tell us a bit more about the work that you're doing and the project that you're doing because there may well be people that are watching this that want to be involved yeah. with that if you can do that that'd be great i certainly can Catherine. <laughs> um, and just a quick point to say that although we're, we're focusing on these communities it doesn't mean that this is just what we're going to be focusing on we are going to get a lot of learnings from this 
work outwards and look at other communities yeah. along down the line. So the project that I'm working on currently is an EDI um, a services improvement project, um, and basically it's insight work. So I'm working with these four key groups, um, people diagnosed with breast cancer who would like to share their experiences so that um, we can identify what their information and support needs are. Um, maybe look at you know what kind of things were missing along their breast cancer journey, what things worked for them as well in terms of um, helping them get through that journey. Um, and just to understand that a bit better so that we can also go back to the drawing board, have a look at our services as well, look at where maybe we can enhance or improve, adapt or tailor our services. Okay. So overall, I, I guess that is kind of like the main aim of it and, and then to increase the uptake from those particular diverse communities. So I, you know, I'm in the middle of the field work at the moment, so I am interviewing a lot of people from those communities who have had a diagnosis of breast cancer and been treated within the UK. If anybody is interested, do get in touch yes. with us. So you, so you want more of those people? You want be, to be yes. in touch with more from the, the, the communities that you've outlined? So just once again, that's um, over 70s, uh, and yep. black women and um, South Asian women, and then anybody that might think of themselves that are in uh, an area of deprivation. Yeah. 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 That's fine. And so, you know, it, it, black or South Asian women, and that's, you know, uh, regardless that that doesn't mean they have to be over 70. So it's over 70. No, sorry, separate. separate yeah. 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 Um, so if you're over 70, regardless of ethnicity and you would like to take part is, and I have tried to make it as accessible as possible. So it's literally having a discussion with me that lasts for about an hour over the telephone in person or online. It depends on whatever suits you. I'm more than happy to work with. Um, and it's about listening to your breast cancer experience and also your ideas and your thoughts about what we could do better, how we could reach your communities better as well. So we're looking for solutions from yourselves. And and, and I think that's because we like to put people with breast cancer who have been affected by it at the heart of the work that we're doing. And it's, it is about collaboration and it is about listening to you we don't want to be sitting here dictating what we think you need we want to hear that from yourselves and we'd also like to hear about certain solutions where you think we could make changes in order to reach your communities um uh, better okay yeah all right so um just on that note really um i suppose um there is the question about where people can go to get support right now it might be helpful just to very sort of quickly outline the services that we've got so i have mentioned that we have the helpline and that we can use language line on that um, we've also got people can contact us as i said right at the beginning um via uh, social media or email us if they want to um uh, and we can respond to those um, queries um, privately. We can also ask people to post their um, questions on and comments on the forum. So there's an Ask Our Nurse area on there. That forum is, is public, so it's a public question and it's a public answer, but privately you can message us or email us. But then we also have support for, through the Someone Like Me team. So that's a, a sort of a one-to-one -one peer support uh, service, which um, a huge amount of people use. Um, and that's whether you uh, have got a breast cancer diagnosis, maybe you've got an increased risk of developing breast cancer because of a genetic um, alteration that has been identified, or maybe you're a family member, that type of thing. And I know we've got a number of volunteers because that's a volunteer uh, run service, not run service, it's coordinated by our lovely colleagues up in Sheffield, but the volunteers that are those peer support is that's peer support we've got a wide variety of people from backgrounds and also that speak different languages as well not every language unfortunately but a wider one and I know the team work hard to be able to sort of get more volunteers for a diverse breadth we've also got our moving forward services specifically for those people who've come to the end of their main hospital treatment obviously people will continue some treatment in a lot of cases at home or still be going in over a year or so uh, to, hosp uh, to hospital for other targeted treatments for instance um, but that specifically uh, can be offered as well and then we've mentioned or I mentioned very briefly our secondary breast cancer our living with secondary breast cancer services um, and across all of those things we've also got services for younger women so that's 45 and under 
for those with early primary breast cancer and also for younger women with secondaries, uh, secondary breast cancer as well. So that's where people can come to us with what we have at the moment. Obviously, we hope that the face of that is going to look a bit different in the future after you've completed your work. But I know that you've been incredible incredibly helpful to me to finding specific support services for people who do come from different backgrounds, particularly, um, you know, sort of ethnic minority and um, sort of background, different backgrounds and finding that suitability for people who want that when actually it's not something that we offer at the moment is really important. And whether that's to the individuals or whether it's to nurses that are trying to support those people as well. So I think you've got a list because you remember them much more than me. All I know is I come to you and say, Sarge, who have you got? And you usually come up with something. So um, we, I, I know we, you've got a list. Um, and yeah. I think if we if we haven't sent that on already to Kevin, who's doing our technical stuff for us today and always does for the Facebook Lives here, it's brilliant. Um, then we can post those as well and make sure that people have access to those and the links but do you want to just pop through and of course we do, do need to just talk about the access to all of the services that i've talked about the face-to-face -face services um as well with the access fund that you mentioned a couple of times yep so the, the access fund is there really to help um uh, those people affected by breast cancer who need to access our services although our services are free when we're delivering them particularly face-to-face -face in, in in on the ground then it's it will obviously cost people to actually get to those so anyone who's in any kind of financial difficulty then the access fund is, is there for to, to help you basically with with things like that as well it's not just restricted to travel it's to other other areas as well yeah and i know that from a second help. i know from second and your best cancer point of view, sometimes it's not necessarily that it is a finance issue. It's a practical issue as well. People are unable to drive themselves. Maybe public transport is a bit scarce or actually they don't feel confident enough to travel on the transport because of, you know, the, their mobility, that type of thing. So um, I know that an awful lot of people access that um, that fund or have been doing them where they have been doing than it is for sort of those practical as well as financial reasons to be able to. To make sure there is equity of access to that and it, the, those barriers that can need to be, be dealt with and um, I think the fund is, I think is, is um, given to us by ASDA isn't it so a big shout out to ASDA to be able to say thank you to them for doing that they're making a big difference to a lot of people who are accessing yeah. those. Yeah, certainly um, and also um, I, I mean, shall I go through the... Um, yeah, if you if you go through yeah. your list, I think it would be just a sort of what it's called and who it sort of supports, etc. then we, that would be really yeah. helpful. But we'll, we'll, we'll use fine. some links and be able to pop them in the chat underneath as well. Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely fine. So, I mean, there are a, a whole uh, number of organisations out there, but again, it's that whole thing about, well, do you know about them? How are people made aware? So um, there are a number of organisations who have been absolutely fantastic Um uh, in, in providing support to particular and, and certain communities because they have the know-how, they're the experts as well. So we have um, the Can Survive UK. Um, they provide support and information for people with cancer. So it's, it's not just breast cancer, it no. is pan cancer. Um, they are based in Manchester, um, but they provide mm -hmm. like support groups and hubs in, in places like the Cathlock Centre Home, Limelight Wellbeing Hub in Old Trafford, Holy Trinity Community Centre and Positive Steps in Oldham as well and Tameside. There's the Safina Muslim Cancer Support Network as well. Uh, they provide advice, support and guidance to those affected by cancer. Again, it's pan cancer. Information, uh, they give information on different types of cancer. They give religious guidance and they also have an online community. Okay. There's uh, one called Sakoon, Sakoon Through Cancer. They also provide support workshops and educational programs for people affected by um, breast cancer, uh, particularly those of South Asian backgrounds. Um, and there's also uh, Black Women Rising, yeah. uh, which is a cancer support project, a registered, registered charity, and they give vital help information and support and practical advice um, uh, to people who've been affected or diagnosed with cancer. There's also um, Croydon BME Forum. They do a whole host of things, but they also have a cancer support project. They do many things across the health areas of health, like long-term conditions, kidney disease. But in relation to cancer, they work across six um uh, uh areas um six southwest london boroughs croydon merton wandsworth sutton richmond and kingston as well to reach and give support to people who really kind of like need it and, and maybe lacking it currently um so yes they're just a number of of, of them as well but 
if, if you want to reach out and you, you want support as well, uh, reach out to us and we'll see what we can do for you. Yeah, um, and like you say, you know, there will be others. That's just a sort of a small list. I'm also conscious that we've said women an awful lot. Um, I know that men isn't a, some, uh, you know, a group that you're focusing on a lot, uh, um, uh, at the moment. Um, but if uh, there is information about support for men on our web pages as well, so just so that we make sure that we include them as well if and people men, need that. Yeah, and men with breast cancer can also take part in my insights. So I have already recruited. Um, Brilliant. Okay. From the group over seventies and those who uh, who uh, might regularly struggle to afford to pay for food bills um, and, and things like for essentials, they can come forward and talk to me if they want to take part in my insight as well. There is also a payment for involvement because it's a thank you for your efforts, okay. for your time, for sharing your breast cancer experience. So. Um, that that comes as, as part of of the insight work as well okay that's really helpful and i suppose beyond that then it's probably worth us just saying you know if you want to continue to support us in the way that of, of you know coming to us with those solutions using your voice giving us your ideas then we've got voices haven't we we've got our louder voices as well oh, but we've got voices we we've got volunteering um all sorts of bits and pieces that people could be um involved with and as you said you know people are at the heart of everything that we do um and it's always brilliant to have a service user or somebody who's had an experience as part of a project or part of our work because they keep our feet on the ground and they tell us how it is it's not us thinking what is going on and what we should be doing we need them to tell us what we should be doing and that's really is the basis of the, the work that you're doing isn't it it is it is Catherine and I'll give you a really good example there so in terms of voices so a great platform for people to come and share what their thoughts are and how creative we can get as well so on my project we will have an advisory panel group that's made of voices members so people affected by breast cancer they help guide and steer my project in the right direction okay. they're a fantastic source for me to go to when i may be facing challenges um, and and they come up with some fantastic realistic solutions as well so if anybody is listening and you think you know your, your your input will be invaluable if you want to sign up to become a volunteer or become a voices member uh, please do okay and our voices information is on the website as well and hopefully the, the the man listening might just pick up on that and we'll find the we'll find uh, get kevin to pop that into um the um into the chat as well so people can find out more information and if they want to find out more about uh, joining voices then they can do so dear, i can't say thank you enough um i know we had chatted about sort of doing this session before and i hope although we've not had any particular questions i hope that that's because people have been listening to you and everything that, that we're doing and that people have found this interesting but um even though we chatted before as i said i've learned so much this evening even though we talked before so i really appreciate always your support when i've come to you um i really appreciate it and i know that you know this is going to make a difference to the services and what we can provide for people i know it's going to take a little bit of time but doing it in the way that we're doing it now and making it as of of, of you know massive importance uh, should hopefully make make a positive difference in the future so thank you so much for joining me um i'm just going to say and remind everybody how they can get hold of us you can message us via social media privately or publicly if you particularly want to but you can email us nurse at breastcancernow.org or if you want to give us a call on the helpline and that might include language line as well then 0808 800 6000 if you're using language line if my memory serves me rightly then somebody just needs to ring and say we need to speak to somebody in this language and then we can do the rest by contacting language line and arrange that um, that connection with an interpreter in between so um, I think there are many many languages that we can access uh, via that service as well thanks a lot Sadia see you soon thank you so much thank you everyone bye bye bye, bye.